Hello everyone. All right, let's wrap this last lecture up. Huh? All right. So let's do this exercise. Elemental phosphorus is often stored under water because it doesn't dissolve in it. Okay. Elemental phosphorus is very soluble in carbon disulfide. So let's draw out carbon disulfide. So carbon disulfide is CS2. And remember, carbon disulfide has um, 4 plus 2 times 6 electrons for sulfur, and that gives us 16 electrons. So carbon will be in the center. Sulfur are, is going to be on the side, and it looks like to maintain an octet, we should put double bonds here and then put two lone pairs on sulfur to maintain the octet on all atoms. And that will give us 16 electrons in total, okay? So this is a non-polar molecule. So it stands to reason that P4 must also be non-polar. So, uh, so even though, you know, I said the lone pair thing, but, um, because of its structure, it's actually not polar. And that's because all the elements are the same. Okay. All right. So P4 is non-polar. See, there's no, there, all the atoms are the same, right? So there's no difference in electronegativity, so it's not going to be polar. So uh, since CS2 is linear and non-polar, it should be soluble in CS2 and not water. So let's just say since P4 dissolves in CS2, a nonpolar compound, based on its symmetrical, you, so you could say something like this, symmetrical structure. Okay, so that's all I expect. All right. So the iodide ion Yeah. Okay. And um, if anyone's wondering why it's non-polar, it's because it's symmetrical. So the dipole moments are symmetrical. So they cancel each other out. Yeah, and we think about the electronegativities here. Um, they're very similar. So the Delta electronegativity is less than, I would say, less than one. So it's going to be nonpolar regardless because of the bonds here. Not very polar. Okay? All right, let's move on to the next example. The iodide ion reacts with iodine and aqueous solution to form the I3 or trioxide ion. So this is what we call the triiodide ion, or we could say tri. Oh, did I say trioxide? I meant triiodide. Sorry, that's a typo for me. So you may not encounter this um, until you take Chem 41, but if you do redox titration with iodine, you'll definitely see this. So what would happen if carbon tetrachloride were added to an aqueous solution that contained a mixture of Ki, I2, and Ki3? Okay. So if it's an aqueous solution, we know carbon tetrachloride is not soluble. So what we would see is two layers. Two layers would form. Two layers would form. Okay. 
Okay. So we know that from the densities in our in our previous problem here, water has a lower density than CCL3, CCL4. So tetrachlor uh, carbon tetrachloride would actually be on the bottom layer. So the denser it is, the the more heavier it is. So two layers would form. So the top layer would be the aqueous top layer. Bottom layer. Okay. So in this case, Ki, so Ki and Ki3 are ionic compounds. So they'll go in the aqueous layer. So we're going to say the top layer will be aqueous. So in this case, it will contain Ki and Ki3 because they are ionic compounds. And ionic compounds are always more soluble in water than organic compounds. And I'll show a table illustrating that, okay? So they're ionic compounds, so they're going to be more soluble in polar, um, um, polar compounds. So in this case, we'll label this polar, and this one will say nonpolar, okay? And polar solvents, okay? So, however, I2 is a nonpolar compound, right? Because it has the same element as part of the molecule. And when that happens, we always get a nonpolar uh, compound. Okay, so we would expect I2 to be here. Nonpolar. Okay. So that's how we would um, kind of work our way through that one. All right. So now let's spend the rest of the time thinking about why some of these compounds dissolve in water. Okay, so what other compounds can dissolve in water? Well, we can have sugar. Sucrose is actually very soluble in water because um, eventually what happens is the water molecules here will interact with the OH groups of sucrose. And then that will form, um, this will cause the individual sucrose molecules to dissolve. And eventually all of them will go into solution. So eventually, if you add sugar to your coffee, eventually all the sugar will dissolve and become sweet. And that's because the water has successfully um, um, solvated all the sugar molecules. Okay, so that's one example. We are, So here's a, uh, another example of how salt dissolves. Water will... Um, use ion dipole forces um, to have these interactions where the, the salt, the uh, Na plus cations and chloride ions are dissolved. And this is because of the very favorable ion dipole force. And so that's why salt readily dissolves and that's because polar molecules will dissolve very polar compounds, okay? So, the, the reason why they dissolve is that the energy that's needed to hold the salt together is compensated by the energy released when, um, when it's solvated by these water molecules. So that's the driving force here, that the, the successful um, solvation of these ions will break up the energy, will provide enough energy to break up the energy required to hold the ions together in the crystal lattice. Okay, so here are some more examples. Here we have an alcohol. So alcohols um, are pretty much organic compounds with an OH group. And so these compounds are, are particularly soluble in water because they have what we call a hydrophobic end, which hates water, and a hydrophilic end, which likes to interact with water. So water will tend to interact with the hydrophilic end and so we have a molecule that's both nonpolar, part of it's nonpolar, part of it's polar, and that has some interesting um, chemistry in the body, um, biochemistry, um, where it kind of permeates through different parts, different organs, 
and interacts intracellularly um, with other cells, okay? So this is an example of decanol, a not very soluble alcohol, but due to the fact it has an OH group, it can actually dissolve in the body or, you know, in, in organic uh, compounds. So that's hydrophilic, hydrophobic. Then we can also classify carboxylic acids. So instead of an OH group, a carboxylic acid has this COOH group, and that's very polar because it can hydrogen bond to a number of compounds. Same with the alcohol, but this is more, uh, more pronounced, okay? So we call these fatty acids. So these are called fatty acids and because um, they constitute a class of molecules in the body, an important class of molecules called fats. And so um, when you break down uh, fat molecules, you actually get a fatty acid and then those can play roles in energy, energy usage. And this is what primarily what foods are made out of. Fat, fats get converted to fatty acids that can be digested by the body and they are polar so they can travel through the bloodstream and water um, to do various functions. So um, there has been studies about fatty acids being linked to you know, like um, better health, heart health, um, better, you know, um, better nutrition and stuff like that. So there's this ongoing debate about the usages of um, certain fatty acids um, about its role in health, okay? So it's polar and hydrophilic, just like the alcohol. Okay, so where do these fatty acids come from? Well, they come from fats or um, this is a common example of what a fat molecule is. It's basically um, uh, long chain fatty esters of glycerol, which is this, this part of the molecule right here is glycerol. And so when we add uh, long chain carbons to the oxygen atoms, those are called triglycerides or what we know as fats. And depending on what kind of groups are attached there, you can get oils, uh, it, it's actually a class of compounds, waxes, lipids, but they're, all, they're just generally known as lipids, which contain oils and fats in the body and in nature. So depending on what kind of groups are attached, you can get a variety of different kind of molecules. And they have very uh, vi wide variety of uses, okay? So this triglyceride uh, specifically is known as tri uh, trimyristin, um, so this comes from nutmeg. So, however, if you treat this glyceride with with um, with um, sodium hydroxide or a strong base, you you can hydrolyze it. A process known as saponification. So what you get is here's glycerol. So here's glycerol. Oops. So glycerol is this molecule right here. And then you get a carboxylic acid salt, the sodium salt of a carboxylic acid or fatty acid. So this is what, this molecule right here is soap. So the soap you use to wash your hands is usually consisting of a fat, the salt of a fat. And the beauty of a soap is that what it does is it, um, so imagine these are the long chain, so here are the long chain um, carbon groups. And here are, is the hydrophobic head right here, okay? So what happens is that the grease and oil will be, will be kind of, what's a good word for it? Will be kind of like isolated and um, trapped by the soap molecules, whereas the hydrophilic end of the molecule or head will be water soluble. So we can actually wash grease and wash our hands, all this uh, grime and stuff using soap because it has a dual purpose. One, it can rinse away with water. So we don't have to use any solvents other than water. And then the, the hydrophobic tail part of the molecule will readily dissolve your grease and oil from your clothes, from your hands. So it makes cleaning very easy environmentally friendly and doesn't use any harsh chemicals. So that's the beauty of soap there. 
And so that's one application of um, these molecules and being soluble in water, okay? So the term we used here to describe this, um, this phenomenon is called emulsions. So they either disperse or emulsify soil particles, coated um, with, um, with compounds. So they allow these things to kind of mix to form an emulsion, which you can then trap with the soap molecule and just wash away with water. So that's how pretty much washing works. Okay, so that's an application there. Now, it's a little bit different when we wash things um, like our clothes. Okay, so when we're washing clothes in the laundromat, we can't actually use, we have to kind of modify the soap molecule. We can't use carpet silk acids no more. Um, the reason is that when you wash carpet silk, when you use soap, to wash certain soaps to wash your clothes, um, usually your 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 um, clothes will contain like metal ions that aren't soluble in water, so calcium or magnesium. So that's what we call hard water. So hard water, if you ever lived in Davis, you may have seen like like scum build up on your sinks and bathtubs, and that's because water doesn't dissolve calcium salts and magnesium salts very well. So to get rid of it, we usually need to wash things with something a little bit more soft. So a water softener is usually a compound that exchanges the ions found in, you know, your water or your, or maybe on your clothes from like debris and stuff or from the soil, because usually soil brings in magnesium, calcium deposits. So what you do is you kind of wash it to make sure all those ions are kind of trapped by the detergent because those now are soluble in water and it'll just wash away with the water. So, but if you use a carboxylic acid salt, um, it'll actually precipitate out and won't be soluble in water. So that's why usually you have to um, wash things um, with a detergent. And detergent is usually, we don't, it's not from a fatty acid or a fat, it's derived from a synthetic detergent, usually you, with a, uh, long acid, uh, fatty acid chain or carbon chain with like a sulfate group or some other uh, synthetic detergent that's water soluble. Okay, so that's um, this first picture shows how it works, and then the detergent, the detergent, the, the kind of soap or detergent molecules right here. So that's the difference between detergents. Detergents have a um, they're not from fatty acids or carboxylic acids. They're actually from acids that have a, that they're from strong acids like sulfuric acid. So it's the R group with a sulfuric acid head group. Okay. So that's what happens. Um, that's what happens when we have hard water. You wash it with detergent. You can get rid of all the, um, the solid the scum that gets precipitated out and that's how we want use, use detergents in our laundry so we're trying to develop detergents that are safe and don't you know have any health effects so usually we try to make detergents from you know naturally occurring compounds that have like no toxicity so um detergents are always almost synthetically made and then soaps um soap is just made from you could just make soap from like vegetable grease or oil and just take it and make it in the lab one day and take it home. So it's pretty easy. You can just take Crisco or something, vegetable oil, hydrolyze with sodium hydroxide and then um, isolate it and you get, you get a nice soap out of it. Hand soap, yeah. Okay, lastly, let's talk about how these things form here. Okay, so, so you see here, it's not good to, um, to use alcohols Alcohol, see the alcohols here? As we increase the carbon chain, we're getting less polar because we're getting more oily part uh, from the carbon atoms. So that's why, you know, octanol is not really soluble in water and then decanol not very soluble at all. But the smaller chain alcohols like methanol to propanol, you get some solubility. You get, you get a lot of solubility there, okay? Then here is an example why alcohols are not very good um, choices for solvents for salts 
because they don't have a great solubility in anything but water. So sodium chloride here has great solubility in water, but poor solubility as we go from methanol to pentanol. So that's why to kind of extract salt or get salt out of a out of like a mixture, we usually have to wash it with water. Um, so if you do pursue chemistry, you actually do a lot of things called aqueous workup, where you um, wash your compound um, to get rid of all the water or foreign material that you don't want. That's solid on water. Okay. All right. So that's um, pretty much the basis for everything about solutions, what dissolved like, dissolved like. But lastly, we're going to talk about what happens when a solid dissolves in water. Okay, so here's the process we'll, we'll talk about. Okay, <coughs> so when an ionic solid dissolves in water, right? Okay, um, the ions that form from the solid are released into solution, right? So they must be attracted to and interact with the polar solvent molecules. So that's why salts don't usually dissolve in like nonpolar solvents like chloroform or carbon tetrachloride because um, they can't interact effectively with the solvent. It has to be polar and water's the best, best thing to do for that. But it can also dissolve in other polar organic solvents, but water's the best, okay? So ionic solids, they, they have a lot of energy. It takes a lot of energy to even melt them or evaporate them. You pretty much can't evaporate a an ionic compound, okay? Because it's almost impossible. It takes so much energy. So let's look here. The, so this this the amount of energy it takes to separate these ions to the gas state. That's called the lattice energy. So that energy is really high. So it takes two thousand thirty three kilojoules per mole. So that's a lot of energy. Okay. So we not might expect this compound to dissolve in water based on the, the high energy, right? But however, um, the energy released from the attraction between barium and chloride ions with water molecules is so large that it overcompensates or compensates the energy required to separate the solid into ions in the first place. So the solvation of the ions in the gas phase. So first, it breaks up the solid. The... Um, so there's so much energy that it converts the atoms or ions into the gas state. But then the water will surround it and that energy is more than enough to compensate um, the separation of the ions into, uh, the separation of the atoms into ions that is a favorable process and that's why it readily dissolves. So as long as your net delta H or enthalpy is negative, there, the process will happen, okay? So overall, this enthalpy process is favorable by 14 kilojoules, okay? So all it has to do is be negative. So this is where the solubility rules become so complicated because each ionic solid, um, the lattice energy depends on both the charge of the ion and the size of the ion. So it's a very complicated thing, but we won't go into that. But just know that the... Um, that there's there's a trick to it that the things that are most soluble the salts that are most soluble are ones that have um the ions are, are are of similar shape and size so the size of the ions matter if we have uh two ions of appropriate size they'll be equally solvated by water so that's good but if they're not the same size they tend to be insoluble because water can't solvate both of them equally but um no need to worry about that because um um i will give you the solubility rules so you don't have to memorize memorize them so i'll give you them in some shape or form okay so let's look at an example where this is not the case so silver chloride is very insoluble in water why is that well Silver and chloride, they're of very different sizes. Silver is much bigger than chloride, I believe. And um, as we all know, silver chloride doesn't really dissolve in water, okay? So it takes a lot of energy to separate it into the gas state, which um, is a little bit lower than barium. And that has to do with the charge, um, pretty much. Uh, so 915 
0.7 kilojoules per mole. But when we solvate the ions, water doesn't solvate silver very well. So the, own, the amount of energy that interacts with water is only negative 850.2. So that's not enough to compensate separating the, the atoms into ions in, in the gas state. So that's not enough. So, so what we do get here is a net positive reaction. So it's endothermic, so it's not favorable because you need to put more energy to dissolve it. So if you were to heat it, you could probably dissolve silver chloride, but still, nonetheless, it's considered insoluble in water because of this unfavorable difference in energy of solvation. So the energy of solvation um, doesn't compensate the, the energy needed to break up the atoms or the solid into its ions, okay? So as a result of this, very little silver chloride dissolves in water. So that's why when we did this test, we saw it precipitate out of solution. So if we kind of think about this in terms of mass, um, less than 0.002 grams of silver chloride will dissolve in a liter of water. So that's pretty much insoluble, okay? So what happens then? So if we have solids with limited solubility, um, we describe them as having what we call a solution equilibrium or solubility equilibrium in solution. And you'll learn more about this in Chem 401 when you talk about equilibrium. Um, so we may have, I don't think we talked about saturated solutions, but essentially when things are saturated, if you're super saturated, um, you ever see those cool like kind of um, videos where a solid immediately precipitates as soon as you added like a single drop of solute. So that's called a super saturated solution where you eventually have a situation where you pretty much dissolve as much solid as you can. And then the addition of any more solid will immediately crash out to the solution. So it looks like it looks these cool videos where you see like, like time lapse videos where it looks like a flower, a solid flower is growing out of the flask. So it's really pleasing to watch. But um, that has to do with the solubility limit of certain um, solids. So silver chloride is one example, but it's pretty much applies to any solution that's past its saturation limit. So any solution, uh, uh, amount of water will only dissolve so much amount of solute. So once you reach the path where it's super saturated and you don't see any solid forming or crashing out, the addition of a single drop or single particle of solute will actually kickstart that process and cause it to um, grow, uh, precipitate out, usually in a beautiful fashion, okay? So the reason I bring this up because um, when a solution is saturated um, with ions, pretty much no more solid will dissolve and you'll just get a lot of solid back in solution. So that's why, you know, if you add too much salt to water, you uh, eventually you get a point where no more will dissolve and that's, Every solid will have a solubility limit. There's no exception, okay? Um, so that's why you, in turn, need more solvent to dissolve everything, okay? So here's some examples of this, of what I'm talking about here. Okay, so see here, so we can measure the solubility limit by using a conduction test. So a conduction of pure water doesn't do anything. There's no there's no ions, but if we do a uh, silver chloride solution, we see the conductivity rise initially, then plateaus, and that's where when it plateaus, that's the solubility limit, where no more ions are forming and the solid is just precipitating out, okay? All right, so no matter how much um, solid, um, so no matter how much more solid is added, you'll never get an increase in conductivity because no more ions are forming, okay? And we can see this in real time if we monitor the time it took um, and see the change in concentration. Eventually, it'll start out pretty rapidly and then it'll plateau because it's reached its limit for solubility. So, First, uh, when, these, when the silver core initially enters water, you'll get some solubility, so this solution is fast, but then, then the reverse reaction competes where the ions now are now joining 
are now combining to form silver chloride because that process is more favorable. And so when we reach an equilibrium, we call this a saturated solution because now no more solids dissolving. Um, and then um, we, we term this thing, um, the amount of substance that's added to a given volume of solvent to form a saturated solution, um, that's called the solubility of a substance. So if you ever look on Wikipedia, you'll see solubility of certain substances in water. So that's pretty much uh, the, the kind of like the measure of how soluble something is. So usually things that are not soluble will have um, less than a gram soluble in 100 milliliters of water or 100 grams of water. So silver chloride is insoluble in this case. So, so in this case, um, we can establish an equilibrium between these two compounds, uh, between this because it's insoluble in water. So that's called the solubility. And you'll learn more about this in Chem 401. Okay, so I believe that's it. Um, that's it for Chem 400. That's the list of topics that will be on the final exam. So the final exam will be mostly on uh, chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11. So I will post more practice problems and I'll post a review catered to what the exam will actually be like. So um, stay tuned for that. But if there are no more questions, I'll, well, sorry, I mean, um, if there are any questions, please send me an email. I'll respond to them. Please stay hard, prepare for the practical, and I'll see everyone in lab. All right, take care.